morning as we join together to remember the life of Jesus the Bradshaw. We also come together to celebrate our life, to share some memories. But most importantly, we come together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gives us the hope and the gift of eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. If you're familiar with the story of Job in the Old Testament, you know that Job went through some great and terrible suffering. And in the midst of that suffering, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end I will, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And we have the comforting words from the book of Deuteronomy, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I ask you to take your hymnal and turn to hymn 671. It says something different in the bulletin, but we're going to be singing hymn 671, Amazing Grace, verses 1, 4, and 5. And look, ask you to stand as we sing again hymn 671, verses 1, 4, and 5.
should, and so I'm going to talk about some things that I think my mother really was a gave to me. Um, I think that's something my dad actually gave to me. He liked to speak a lot, so. Uh, <laughs> um, so first and foremost, I really want to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, this beautiful, appropriate funeral letter. Um, family and friends from all over the place. Um, my friend Mike came from Canada, so I pretty much consider that Canada. Um, there's part of me that wasn't really keen on speaking today, and there's another part that really felt like I should needed to speak. Um, and I attribute both of those to my mom. The part that I did want to speak, I think, is on her German side. I tend to be a little more reserved um, with their emotions, um, and I definitely uh, do that part. The other part I felt like I should speak also was more directly from my mom. Um, you know, she was someone, she didn't really suffer, you know, you're crying very much. Uh, she basically told you to just get up and do it. I can see, you know, apologize for the accident, you know, her saying, uh, Sean, something such a blues, get up there and start speaking. <laughs> so I felt obliged to her. We actually are recording this and our German family is going to be watching me in Berlin soon. So, Blue Scott, Blue Garden, Unfit, Doris, Marina, and all the others. Um, so this is where I say some very nice things about my mom, so let's get going. Anyone who spent a appreciable amount of time around my mother, Knows that she would get a really big pain in the butt. Uh, this is an untraditional way of start a eulogy, but if you know her, you know what I'm talking about. She was literally one of the most stubborn people that I ever met. If I told her to go left, she went right. If I told her to go up, she went down. I think sometimes she did the exact opposite of what the logical sense dictated just because she could. I think it was one of her best attributes. My mom took her own path, which taught me to do the same. Because she never felt it was necessary to inform anyone's idea of how she should be. Live your own life. Make your own happiness. Be ridiculous. Just because it makes you laugh. People who love you will understand the story about you. People who don't, lack of a better term, my mom will say this, screw up. My mom also sometimes lacked the filter when telling me other people what they should be doing. She didn't create the situation. She was still the direct. You were being an idiot, she told you were being an idiot. If you were being a crybaby, she told you that also. I was always thought it was very courageous. It's easier to tell people what they want to hear. It's a lot more difficult to tell them what they don't want to hear. I'm sorry, Scott, I'm going to have to tell the story, but one of the, uh, my favorite stories of my mom is uh, Scott, who's one of my oldest dear friends, had come to my house. and. Uh, we were pre-teens, and puberty had caught up with Scott, and Scott hadn't caught up with the notion of deodorant. <laughs> my mom basically told him that he was sticking up the house, and he had to go home and put on some speed stick. <laughs> Scott, I just told a story the other day, and it really isn't a story about me on this Bradshaw. I think he really feels the warmth that she cared enough to let him know. So, in case my remarks are too much about one side of my mom, then we had a few more questions. She was very warm giving. But we were certainly not poor growing up. We didn't have a ton of money, but I never felt for even a second that I didn't have a ton of money didn't want it. My mother would buy packs of little alligator patches and so on to generic polish. <laughs> younger kids here don't know what I'm talking about, but in 1982, that was an important thing. Um, we just got through Christmas. The holidays in my house were amazing. Christmas will never feel as much like Christmas as it did in my house on Harrison Road. There was candles, it was great Christmas carols on the radio. She would put on a pile of Red wine, sipping, cloves, and orange peel, orange peel, and whole stelts. House would smell like an apple pie. She would never buy a candle that smelled like something. She would make the actual thing. She detested fake scents, fake batteries, and fake people. She was keeping it real, playing the focus that thing today. So, this service, uh, you know, is not to mourn my, mom, my mom's death, it's to celebrate her life. She had a really wonderful and exciting life. She lived through so much history, and if you think back to it, it's incredible. She was around for World War II. She was there for the Berlin blockade, and she came to the States. She got to see all of her children grow into adults and experience personalities of all grandchildren, including my youngest member. Ten years ago, I was living in New York, and uh, you know, let's be frank, I didn't know a whole lot of uh, uh, happening in my life. It was probably like a, a 90 cent chance I was going to have a name like a restaurant, a single bachelor, a gentleman, uh, the rest of my life. And so, what I'm really most thankful personally is that she was able to see my greatest accomplishment. That's Max. It's all over. I hope I can read.
raise that. Here is me. Here is me. My uh, thoughts are going to mirror my brother's. Um, they're sure that we Mark's as well. So we were raised by the same mother. Don't they? <laughs>
the many quilts that she made square by square, uh, the eggs that she would blow out, the yolk out of an Easter and then hand paint, uh, hand paint Christmas ornaments, and not to mention many hats, scarves, blankets, um, and things that she knitted for us and our children over the years. When my mom passed, uh, my brothers and I heard from so many of you and others that couldn't make it here today that my mom had touched over the years. People in Germany, in Baltimore, in Belgium, in Frederick, and at the only friends retirement community. My mom had certain expressions that she used over the years. One, when we were mired in indecision over a job or perhaps a relationship was, she had to get off the pot. <laughs> Sorry. Um, other ones were a little bit more obscure Berliner type expressions. There's one she would say, and it was, excuse my German, which means, translates to something like, he's like spit on my arm. <laughs> Another that she used often over the years was bloom where you're planted. Well, my mom bloomed. She bloomed in Germany. Community. I'm not a botanist, but I believe that those blooms result in lots of seeds in my mom's spirit touching many people. And my mom really believed that after death, she would bloom again in heaven. I'm just going to like to read this in closing, just this quick poem. Uh, the Reaper and the Flowers. There is a reaper whose name is Death, and with his sickle keen, he reaps the bearded grain out of breath and the flowers that grow in between. Shall I not have that as fair? That shall I have not that is fair? Saith he, have not but the bearded grain. Though the breath of these flowers is sweet to me, I will give them all back again. He gazed at the flowers with tearful eyes. He kissed their dropping leaves. It was for the Lord of Paradise. He bound them in his sheaves. My Lord has need of these flowers, gay, the reaper said and smiled. <clears throat> Dear tokens of the earth are they, their feet as once a child. They shall all bloom in fields of light, transplanted by my care, and saints upon their garments white, these sacred blossoms wear. And the mother gave in tears and pain the flowers she did. She most did love. She knew she should find them all again in the fields of light above. Oh, not in cruelty, not in wrath, the reaper came that day. Twas an angel visited the green earth and took the flowers away.
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we rejoice that the souls of those who have died trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ live with you in everlasting joy and happiness. We thank you for the life of Gisela and for all that you have given us through her. And we thank you that in mercy you have delivered her from the miseries of this sinful life. In your great goodness, Lord, complete soon the number of your chosen children and hasten the coming of your kingdom so that along with all who have departed trusting in Christ, we may be made perfect in body and soul. In your eternal glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, who gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to suffering and death on the cross and raised him to life and glory, grant to us and all who mourn a patient faith in time of darkness and strengthen our hearts with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And merciful God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the resurrection and the life, raise us from the death of sin to the life of righteousness so that when we depart this life, we may be found trusting in Jesus Christ and therefore receive your eternal blessing. And it's in his most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. If you'll take your bulletin, you'll find an insert there. You'll find the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. You'll notice that the words were written by Horatio Spafford. He was a lawyer who lived in Chicago. And uh, his wife and daughters traveled, were traveling to Europe by ship, and he was going to go meet them later. And as the ship was traveling across the Atlantic, it was hit and it sunk. Uh, Horatio Spafford received a telegram from his wife, saved alone. Her three daughters had drowned in the midst of that uh, shipwreck. On his way over to pick up his wife and to meet with her, uh, he went out onto the ship right over the place where the, um, the ship had sunk, and then he went back to his room and he wrote the words that we'll be singing now, It Is Well With My Soul. So let us stand as we sing together. <laughs>
not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment when the pit is an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. This reading is from Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4, read from the New Living Translation. I heard a, sh a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. It's a privilege for me to uh, know Gisela. No, Gisela, I uh, met her uh, through a Bible study that I'm still involved in. Uh, the Bible study was one from St. Timothy. I think it's been around for 100 years at this point. Uh, uh, some of the folks are here today, and it's a uh, privilege to get to know Gisela. There were times that uh, I would talk to her in the Bible study. There were also times where I had a privilege of blessing her home down in Frederick. So uh, there were times that we were out at her home there. and. Uh, and also probably the most um, significant times were when Gisela went with us on the retreat down to Rehoboth Beach and uh, we would sit around and talk and chat and uh, she would share stories, she would share things her father would tell her, she would talk about her family and the, and the things that they were doing and uh, how important you all were to her and uh, uh, so it was a privilege for me to be able to join together with you today. And, uh, this is a sad time. But uh, for the Christian, this is a special moment. Although we are sad because we will miss Gisela, the wonderful news of the gospel is that the moment that Gisela died, she went to be in the presence of her Savior. And it's important for us to share with one another the gospel of Jesus Christ. We often think of, as Christians, of sharing the gospel as something that you share with people who are not believers, but we need to be reminded of the hope that we have through Jesus Christ and the gift that he has given us. We also need to share the gospel because there are folks today wondering what happens to them when they die. Will they go to heaven? Will they go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ? Will they know peace? Will they know joy in the moment of their death? If you've ever been to a wedding, you've probably heard, read the scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the passage, the very passage on love. And at the very end of that chapter, we are told to abide in three things. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these being love. And I just want to share briefly and touch on those three words this morning. The first word is faith. Faith is something that we practice every day. Uh, you probably exercise great faith coming here this morning that your car would get you here without sliding off of the road. Uh, you travel across bridges trusting that they were built by people in such a way that they would not collapse. Uh, the family invites you to a reception after the service and you're going to sit down and eat food that's been prepared by people you've never met. Trusting that it's not going to do you any harm. As a matter of fact, right now you're trusting that this building has been built in such a way that it's not going to come crashing down on you. Faith is an important thing when it comes to the Bible because the Bible tells us that it is by grace we are saved through faith. This not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In other words, it's not what you do that gets you into heaven, it's by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But there was a young father who was trying to get that point across to his children, and they lived in a two-story house, and he went, he shared that verse with his kids, and then he said to them, I'm going to go up on the second floor, and he put them at the bottom of the steps, and he said to them, for a moment, I want you to pretend that I'm God in heaven, and I want you to come join me. But based on what I shared with you about that verse, that you can't do anything to get up here on your own, that means you can't run up the steps, you can't climb up the railing, you can't shimmy up the walls. How are you going to get up here to be with me in heaven? Well, his kids thought and thought. They tried all different things. They tried running up the steps. He said, nope, it doesn't work. He would send them back down. They tried climbing the railing. He said, no, nope. sent them back downstairs. They kept trying to think of a way to do this. Couldn't come up with anything. 
Uh, they got in a huddle at one point, figured if they put their minds together, maybe they could come up with something. Eventually, they came up with the idea of building a pyramid. So they began building this pyramid, thinking that the person who was at the top of the pyramid would be able to jump to get to be with their father. And he said, no, nope, that won't work either. He also stopped me because he was afraid somebody was going to get hurt. Well, finally, after they were about to give up, one of his children said, hey, Dad, can you come down here for a minute? So his dad came down the steps. He said, Dad, turn around and squat down. His dad did. He jumped on his father's back and he said, okay, Dad, you can go upstairs now. And that's really the picture that we have before us of what God did for us. God came down from heaven in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus lived among us. He died as the perfect sacrifice. And when we put our faith and our trust in him, in other words, when we get on his back, he is the one who gets us in the heart. That's significant because that's the way Lisa lived, lived her life. It was a life of trust, a life of relying on her Lord Jesus Christ. She had some pretty tough times, some physical troubles, other troubles in her life, and yet through it all, she held on to him as he held on to her. It's because she had her faith and her trust in him. And the reason that we can put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ comes to that second word. That word is hope. The Bible tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Often when we talk about hope today, it's more like wishful thinking. I hope I get that job. I hope I get to go on that trip. I hope I'll see that person again. There's always this element of doubt. But the Bible, when it talks about hope, is something that's sure and certain, something beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that's because we put our hope in a God who can be trusted, a God who keeps his promises, a God who does what he says he will do. God made an awful lot of promises in the Bible. And his people can trust those promises because God always came through. He has a lot more promises to keep. He promises to come back for us. And so we hold on to him and put our faith and our hope in him. And the reason that we can put that faith and that hope in God comes down to that last word. And that last word is love. We all know the scripture. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. One story that I'd love to share is a story about a little guy by the name of Brandon. Brandon was about five years old. And every Saturday morning when Brandon would get up and go down to breakfast, his parents would be getting things together and they would say to Brandon, okay, Brandon, you have a choice this morning. You can have eggs, you can have waffles, you can have pancakes, you can have cereal, whatever you want. Well, Brandon loved pancakes. And so without fail, every Saturday morning, his parents were making pancakes. One Saturday morning, Brandon woke up. And as he was making his way down to the kitchen, he noticed that the lights were out. His parents had actually overslept. They had a pretty rough week. And so Brandon got this brainstorm. He thought to himself, you know, my mom and dad fix me pancakes every day, every Saturday. Now's my chance to get that breakfast. And so he went over to the cupboard and he grabbed the bowl and he put it on the counter. And then he went to get the flour out of the pantry. And as he went to the pantry and opened the door, he noticed that the flour was up on one of the top shelves. And he could just barely reach it. He could get the corner of the bag with his fingers, so he grabbed the bag, and as he pulled it, he figured he would catch it. Uh, but unfortunately, he missed, and the bag came tumbling down. And if you know, if you ever picked up a bag of flour in a store, you know how careful you have to be. What hit him on top of the head, it split open. Flour went crashing onto the floor. He was covered. His pajamas, his head, everything in flour. He looked down at what was left in the bag, and he thought, oh, why not? And he picked it up, and he went over and dumped it into the bowl. He then went over to the refrigerator to get the milk out of the refrigerator. He opened the door. The cart was on the top shelf. It was a gallon jug that his mom had just opened the night before. And he went and pulled it off the shelf. He didn't realize how heavy it was. It was a little wet from condensation. When he pulled it off, it slipped out of his hand. It crashed onto the floor. The plastic lid popped off. Milk came flying out of the top of the milk cart, all over the inside of the refrigerator, all over Brandon's face, Brandon's pajamas. He looked down at what was left in the milk and he thought to himself, you know, that's probably what my mom and dad used. So he went and he dumped the rest of the milk into the bowl. He then went back to the refrigerator to get the eggs, and as he pulled the eggs off the shelf, all the half, front half of the carton was empty. The other half had the eggs, so it was a little weighted um, against him. Pulled it off, it slipped out of his hand, whacked onto the floor. He thought, oh no, I'm done. But he opened the carton gingerly, and, and when he looked inside, he noticed that there were still two eggs left. So he put an egg in each hand, he walked over to the, the counter, and as he was walking over to the counter, he noticed that the cat had now jumped up on the counter and was drinking the milk out of the bowl. 
<laughs> so he swatted the cat off the counter, but when he went to swat the cat, he missed. He hit the ball, knocked the ball on the floor, broke both eggs in his hands, and just stood there looking at the mess. It was kind of one of those Dennis the Menace moments. There's a cloud of flour still in the air, and the refrigerator doors open with eggs and milk and flour. And he thinks to himself, I'm in big trouble. So he goes over and gets a few wads of paper towel and begins cleaning up the mess, and he's just really making it worse. It's like a child finger painting, and he's smearing it all over the place. But what Brandon didn't realize was that the entire time his father had been standing in the doorway watching. His father actually followed him down the steps, but he wanted to see what his son was up to. So he started walking towards Brandon. When he did, Brandon caught his dad out of the corner of his eye, and he did. His bottom lip began to quiver, tears started streaming down his cheeks. But what his father did was something special. His father knelt down in the midst of that mess, opened his arms, and embraced his son and hugged him. Why is that story so important? Because that reminds us of God's love for us. God watches us from heaven. He sees how we live our lives. He sees the mess that we make. Even the good things we try to do, even our best intentions, are riddled with sin. We make a mess of our lives. We make a mess of this world. But God came down from heaven. He opened his arms and died on the cross and embraced us that we might be forgiven. The Bible tells us that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Although we have ruined things, although we've made a mess of our lives, although there is sin, the wonderful news is through Jesus Christ we have been forgiven. Gisela put her faith and her trust in Jesus Christ. And because of that, she had the hope of eternal life, and her sins were forgiven. And the moment that she closed her eyes, she went to be in the presence of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know, now, as, as we was read for us, there's no more sorrow, there's no more crying, no more pain, no more sadness. She knows the joy and the hope of being in the presence of her Savior. And although we're sad and we will miss her, the wonderful news is that we rejoice because we will see her again. The Bible says when the trumpet call of God sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are alive are left. And we call it together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. What encouraging words we have for us as we remind ourselves of the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in Father, we are overwhelmed by the love that you show us each and every day, by the grace that you have given us through Christ, by the peace that we have even in this time of sadness because we know that we will see Esau again through faith in Christ. So I pray, Lord, that each person here would know that joy and know that peace. And through these days, I ask you once again to continue to give her family the grace and the strength they need, knowing of your love for them through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you'll take the hymnal once again and turn to hymn 488, we're going to sing all the verses of Be Thou My Vision. Again, it's hymn 488.
ago with them uh, in light of the weather and everything, but to uh, go ahead and go down to Brock Hall and then I'll be back shortly. Also, as you leave today, if you haven't had a chance to get signed a guest book, we encourage you to do so. Let's bow our hearts for the benediction. <coughs> And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, now and for our own Lord. Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. 
As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his commands. It has pleased Almighty God to take from this world the soul of Gisela of Bradshaw here departed, and we now commit her body to the grave in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life for all who trust in Christ, who will change our frail and mortal bodies to be like the glorious resurrection body, according to his mighty power by which he is able to transform all things. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.